today we're going to be talking about the science of psychology and neuroscience. So key question, how can we possibly use objective scientific methods to study something that is fundamentally subjective, which is the human mind? Uh, and furthermore, how can we get science itself to be objective in the first place? And if everything that is created by science is created by human minds and human minds are fundamentally subjective, how do we ever break out of that? We'll then look at a brief history of psychology and neuroscience and the trajectory of thought and research over the years and different paradigms that have shaped the approach. The very fact of paradigms is an indication of the subjectiveness of science. Finally, we'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty about different methods and how you actually collect and analyze data in psychology and neuroscience. So let's get right into it. <laughs> let's enter the matrix. So uh, as we said in the overview, this scene in the movie uh, the Matrix is just so compelling for me. It just came out of nowhere and, you know, rocked my world, right? And and the weird thing about this is that people think that this could actually be true, okay? And and they're not just kind of like, oh, maybe that's sort of possibly true. Uh, they think it actually might be true. And the reason really goes back to Rene Descartes. Uh, and really goes back further, way further. Um, probably everybody's had this thought at some point. Um, but, you know, this, this really fundamental point that the only thing we really know is our own subjective experience. And this is really captured by the phrase cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. The only thing I know for sure is that I'm sitting here thinking. Right. So maybe it's a little bit hard to kind of resonate with this perspective. But if you really, you know, get super skeptical and you're like, I question everything. OK, <laughs> one of these people who just like doesn't take anything for granted. Right. This is actually what philosophers are supposed to do for us is not take anything for granted and try to figure out everything from first principles. And when you trace it all back and you really think about it really hard, you can't escape this basic constraint that, you know, all we have is our own subjective experience. Everything else is completely filtered through the lens of that subjective experience. And this leads to the possibility that we were just talking about and it's captured in the Matrix movie called solipsism, which is that there is only subjective reality. You could be a brain sitting in a vat and uh, you know some evil scientist is just providing your sensory input and you would never know the difference because all we have is our sensory input, right? Um, we have no way of really knowing what's going on out there except through our own subjective experience. Okay, I'll stop saying that. <laughs> Descartes took it a little a step further and said, you know, that, that that means that there has to be some kind of dualism, that our subjective experience is somehow separate from objective reality, okay? Um, and I think about that in a slightly different way. I think of subjective reality, subjective experience as essentially being a different perspective on objective reality. So first of all, it's primary. OK, so we know that's our only kind of real perspective. Um, that's the way in which we view the world. But it also is, I believe, and many people believe the case that there is an objective reality. Right. <laughs> you don't have to believe that. It is fundamentally a choice because of the primacy of subjective reality. But if you believe there is an objective reality, there's actually a very consistent way of understanding everything. So you can see objective reality is out there. I'm in it. I can see other people living and existing. I can see other people having thoughts. Uh, I can see them questioning the same things I question. Uh, we can have conversations about it. I can kind of get that sense of intersubjectivity. I can relate to the perspectives that a lot of other people have. Uh, and I can sort of see, well, you know, probably the simplest explanation of what's happening here, the most consistent explanation is we're all just kind of beings in this weird, you know, planet that we happen to find ourselves on in this weird universe that's unimaginably huge and infinite probably. And 
wow, okay, so here we are. Uh, we're all wrestling with these fundamental questions, but um, I think the consistent explanation that we're all kind of basically experiencing more or less the same kinds of things just makes sense. It just seems very consistent. It's like other people describe, you know, how physics works in a way. And I go, I could go, you know, roll a ball down a ramp or whatever I want to do. And it works out. I could go run the chemistry experiments like I did in high school, you know, all the stuff that other people are describing about how, how the, how the world works comes true. Um, not all of it, but, uh, the stuff that's based on science. So I think there's enough evidence for me that there is an objective reality and that uh, I'm part of it. And therefore, it's a kind of dualism because I have my own unique personal subjective experience, which only I can have. I am the only one who can have this. You can't have it. It's mine, my experience. <laughs> Why? Because I'm this. I am this brain. Okay. Wow. I'm just sitting here and I'm this brain and you can't be in my brain because I'm already in my brain. And if you were in my brain, I would kind of notice, right? That's the whole thing. How could you possibly start telling my eyes where to move or making my hands move without me noticing? I would notice. And if you're kind of infecting my thoughts with your thoughts, I'm gonna notice and that's gonna be different and it's gonna be a different subjective experience than if it was just me in here, okay? So stay out, <laughs> it's mine, and you can have your own experience, all right? So that's the way it works, right? It makes sense that, in fact, my subjective experience, again, when we think of the most kind of consistent, simple, straightforward explanation, my subjective experience is the result of my brain. I am my brain, right? And therefore, uh, I don't think there's a dualism because it's like, you know, it's not like there's something else, right? Okay. <laughs> a lot of people think there is, but I'm just okay with like, it's just me uh, and my brain. But uh, what I do have is this incredible subjective experience that my brain allows me to have. And, and there are properties of my brain that enable me to have these kinds of experiences, whereas, you know, your typical rock is not having these experiences as far as I know. And that's the other thing. I really don't know what other experiences other people have or rocks or other things in the world. Um, each thing in the world that's physical <clears throat> presumably has its own perspective. It has its own place that it's looking out at the world from. And, and so in principle, you know, uh, Spinoza theoretically made this point that, you know, everything could have some kind of, you know, subjective experience in principle. But my subjective experience is a product of my of the fact that I am a brain and a brain is a really special thing in the universe. A brain is not like any other kind of thing in the entire universe. All right. Of course, it's like your brain. <laughs> but other than that. Uh, it's pretty special. Um, and, uh, and so brains give us a really rich subjective experience. There's so many moving parts in a brain. Of course, they're not really moving, but they're doing stuff. They're active. They're computing. They're talking. They're communicating. And all those conversations that my neurons are having give rise to this kind of amazing interconnected web of activation spikes, neural spikes that are flowing around. Um, and so my brain can kind of coordinate and organize and consolidate uh, around particular ideas like the ones I'm having now, and then it can move on to the next one, but it has a kind of consistency or coherency that allows me to have some feeling like there's a thing, there's a self. There's a thing called me and an experience that I can actually kind of be aware of because all parts of my brain are kind of sharing in this same uh, overall event. And so that's, to me, what gives rise to the important critical characteristics of subjective experience. Uh, 
and and they're consistent with what I know objectively about the brain, right? So again, the simplest story is everything I know from objective science, I haven't really, you know, done the experiments, but I've sure read all about them. Um, but people have, you know, really looked inside brains in great detail, and we know a lot about brains. Um, and so, you know, we can put together all those ideas and sort of come up with a coherent story that makes sense and holds together. So that's why I believe that there is kind of not really a dualism in any real sense, in any kind of material sense, but rather a dualism of perspective. I have my perspective uniquely, subjectively on the world within an otherwise objective world that nobody really knows exactly. We only have approximations. We only get our subjective sense of this crazy objective reality out there. Okay. <laughs> so again, philosophy, the point of philosophy is to try to think about stuff way too much, you know, right? Okay. That's why it's like philosophy, thought, uh, thinking about stuff, overthinking stuff. Anyway, let's move on.